Welcome to Andy Staples on three, and it is time for best case and worst case scenarios. That's right. We're going over what happened Saturday, looking forward to what's going to happen over the next few weeks for a few select teams that could potentially compete for the national title or could compete for conference titles. There's a lot ahead of some of these teams. Some of the floors have been raised. Some of the ceilings have been lowered. We got a lot to talk about because there is a lot to chew on from what happened on Saturday. We are going to do best case, worst case for Penn State, for Ohio State, Alabama, Tennessee, Nebraska, and Kansas State. It's going to be very interesting. We'll have some very special guests to help us out with that. What is the absolute best possible outcome? What's the worst it could get? Some of these teams, the worst ain't so bad. There's one in particular, though, the best doesn't feel as good as its fan base is going to want. I think I think we know who we're talking about here. I think they, they're the ones that didn't win the game in Columbus on Saturday. But before we get to that, it is Sunday, so we've got to do the resume ranking. We have a new number one in the resume rank, and that is your Ohio State Buckeyes. Beat Penn State. Already had that win at Notre Dame. The Buckeyes have had some serious tests. They have passed them all, and beating Penn State shorthanded on offense, even more impressive. So they're at number one. I have Michigan I have Michigan at number two. And I'll admit, this was a tough one because the idea of the resume ranking is you don't use any preseason hype. You don't. It's only based on the results from this year. And Michigan has not played anybody good this year yet. But the thing is, the Wolverines just keep smashing every team in front of them. They crushed Michigan State on Saturday night. Shut them out. I don't know what else Michigan can do. You can only play the schedule that's in front of you, and they just annihilate everyone. So I, I'm done with it. I'm, I'm putting them at number two. If they play Penn State and it's not, they don't look that great on November 11th, then we can adjust. But if they keep doing this to everybody, you just keep moving them up. And there's only one more place to move them. Number three, Oklahoma, that win against Texas. Still looking pretty good, but... The Sooners had to survive, but you're going to see that is a common theme among this next group of teams. At some point, they've had to survive a clunker. Oklahoma's clunker was against UCF. If they play like that against some of the teams down the stretch, they are going to lose one. And so they fortunately have the luxury of maybe dropping one and still being in the college football playoff race and still being the Big 12 championship race. The the team they beat in Dallas, Texas does not have that luxury, but we're not at Texas yet. Now we are at Florida State at number four. The Seminoles beat Duke. It was a very close game. It was 20 to 17 Duke for pretty much all of the third quarter. When Riley Leonard got knocked out, re-aggravating that ankle injury, that is when Florida State took over. And Florida State ended up running away with it, but they were challenged. They were challenged against Boston College. They were challenged against Clemson, which now, by the way, has three ACC losses. It's not going to be a cakewalk for Florida State, and and but they understand that, and they're still sitting there with a zero in the loss column, unlike North Carolina, the team that entered this past weekend undefeated. They lost to Virginia. So Florida State can look at that and say, you know what? We didn't play our best, but at least we did get that W. and. The other team that can say that, number five, Washington. Let's be real here. Washington was lucky to beat Arizona State. Very lucky. There was a play. It was originally called defensive holding. Washington player just grabbing an Arizona State uh, Arizona State player's jersey. For whatever reason, they picked up the flag. You can, you can throw a conspiracy theory at it. I, I don't necessarily believe in officiating conspiracy theories for conferences that aren't going to exist next year. So I'd say they probably just messed up. But Washington got off very easily because that could have resulted in an Arizona State score. Instead, Arizona State throws a pick six that allows Washington to take the lead. And that is how Washington really won the game. But you got to win your clunkers, and they did. Number six, I have Georgia. Georgia, not like Michigan, in that they've been inconsistent. They've had one game where they really turned on the Jets and crushed somebody, and that was Kentucky. But they struggled with Auburn. Didn't even look great against Vanderbilt. 
fell behind against South Carolina. This is not a perfect Georgia team. Brock Bowers is injured right now. They can move up, though. The thing about Georgia is the next part of the schedule. We don't know that Florida is that good, but they are a five and two team right now. So if they beat Florida, if they beat Ole Miss, if they beat Missouri, Georgia's going to move way up, probably top three in the resume rankings, and they'll stay number one in the polls. That's the thing. It, Georgia's not going to get moved unless they almost lose or do lose in those polls. Michigan's going to keep creeping up. Michigan's going to going to take more first place votes if they keep winning the way they're winning. But I wouldn't worry about Georgia in this ranking either because if they if they play to their potential, they'll move up very quickly into the top three. Number seven, Texas. They have the win against Alabama, which is a big win that looks better and better every week. But they had to escape Houston. That was not what that game should have been. Texas should have rolled in that game. They were rolling in that game and then let Houston back in it. Quinn Ewers got hurt. You saw Malik Murphy. This is going to... This is going to be a interesting next few weeks for Texas. They're better than BYU. I do realize BYU beat them the last time they played. That was 2013 and 2014. Those were the, the, the Taysom Hill times. The Kansas State game for Texas, though, could be very interesting on November 4th. We'll talk about that a little later with Derek Young of K-State Online because some of the stuff that's happened with the Wildcats over the last week or two make them a really intriguing opponent for Texas down the stretch. Number eight, Oregon. The Ducks got back on track. Took them a little while. It was a slow start, but they rolled in the second half against Washington State. Bounced back from that Washington loss. Doesn't get any easier for them, though. They are going to Salt Lake City. Utah just beat USC and LA. Now Oregon and Utah in what amounts to an elimination game in the Pac-12 race. Number nine, Alabama. We'll talk about the Tide later. I was at the Alabama-Tennessee game. I will tell you what the best case and worst case scenarios are for the Crimson Tide this year. Right now, they're looking pretty good. Listen, they got to keep winning. They, they don't have a margin for error. They have to beat LSU probably to win the SEC West. They're off this week. LSU's off this week. They play in Tuscaloosa on November 4th. We will see what happens. But Alabama has put itself in a position to still be in the mix for the national title. It doesn't feel like this is a team that could win the national title, but they could get better. And so this is a good spot. This is a striking distance kind of spot for Alabama. Number 10, Utah. The Utes went to Los Angeles. They beat USC. The defense came, came up when it needed to. Bryson Barnes, walk-on quarterback, Filling in for Cam Rising. Looks like he will be filling in the rest of the season for Cam Rising now that we know the full extent of, of the knee injury that Rising suffered in the Rose Bowl. And Barnes looks more and more comfortable in that offense as every week goes by. Led the team on a drive to set up a game-winning walk-off field goal. Had a great run there at the end of the game. Utah can be a factor in this. Utah, Utah's not out of the national championship race, much less the Pac-12 race. They have one loss. It's in Corvallis to a good Oregon State team. Utah can take this over because they have to play Oregon and Washington still. If they beat Oregon and Washington, Utah is playing for the Pac-12 title. We'll see what happens. Saturday is the next big elimination game in the Pac-12. Now, what does this all lead to? This leads to the college football playoff, the New Year's Six, the last year of the new year six and the last year of the four team college football playoff on Monday. We will imagine what the world will look like if they'd been smart and gone to the 12 team playoff this year. But unfortunately the Alliance screwed that up for, for everybody. This is what we get. We get a 14 playoff. We get the new year six bowls. Here are my projections as we stand coming out of this weekend. Number one, Georgia. Again, remember Georgia has games coming up where they're going to be able to solidify that spot or they'll lose it because they lost one of the games. But if they keep winning, they'll solidify that spot at number one in the polls. Playoff committee, we'll see what they do. But by the time they meet, Michigan still will not have played Penn State. They're, they're going to rank the teams a couple times before Michigan plays Penn State. We'll, I, I'm curious to see where they put Michigan, but it's, it's probably Georgia 1 or Michigan 2 or Ohio State if Ohio State were to beat Michigan. But 
SEC champ, Big Ten champ, basically. But I've got Georgia number one playing as number four Oklahoma in the Sugar Bowl. Yeah, if you want to run back the Rose Bowl from a few years ago, if you want them, if they would like to play a game that good again, please do. We'll take it. We will take that. I've got number two Michigan versus number three Florida State in the Rose Bowl. I think this would be a really fun game. I, I think Florida State against this Michigan team would be a great matchup. Michigan, again, until I see them play Penn State and Ohio State, it's it's really hard to judge how they would handle a group of athletes like Florida State's. But Florida State's receivers might be the only ones talented enough, except maybe LSU's receivers, but LSU's defense won't probably won't allow them to get in this. Might be the ones talented enough to challenge that Michigan secondary, make that Michigan secondary work, and Jordan Travis is mobile enough that even if the line can't protect him perfectly, he can squeeze some passes off of those guys. So I would I would like to see that matchup. I think it'd be a lot of fun. The Orange Bowl, remember, they have to have an ACC team, and I have Florida State making the playoff. So that's why North Carolina's in there. We'll see if North Carolina winds up there, because if you can lose to Virginia, you can lose to anybody on your schedule. And oh, by the way, Miami, don't forget about them. They did lose to North Carolina. They did lose to Georgia Tech, but they beat Clemson in double overtime on Saturday. Not done yet, and they still got to play Florida State. I got North Carolina against Alabama in the Orange Bowl. The way that works is the next highest SEC team would have to go to the Orange Bowl. None of the other bowls have any contractual obligations, so it just sort of works out how they pick them. Probably going to see the, the highest-ranked group of five champ go to the Fiesta. So we've got Air Force versus Oregon in the Fiesta right now. We'll see if Air Force winds up running the table in the Mountain West. If they do, I think they'll be that highest-ranked group of five champ. If they drop one... If they don't win, if it winds up being Fresno State or Wyoming, there's also a chance that Tulane wins the American and winds up being that team that gets that bowl spot. And Tulane obviously did that last year, beating USC in the Cotton Bowl. The Cotton Bowl in this projection, Texas versus Ohio State. I had that last week. I'm good with that. I would love to see that game. Let's make it happen. And in the Peach Bowl, Washington versus Penn State, which we have seen in a, in a few different bowl games against uh, this Washington offense against that Penn State defense, I, I, I would enjoy that. Going to need to see more from the Penn State offense. We'll talk about that in a few minutes with J.D. Pickell, who was at the Ohio State-Penn State game when we do best case, worst case for the Nittany Lions. But I would enjoy that defense matching up against Michael Penix Jr. and the Washington offense. We'll see what happens. But right now, we got to figure out what the best cases are what the worst cases are. We're going to get to that right after I tell you about prize picks. Prize picks, the most fun daily fantasy game on the planet. Had a, I had a pretty good weekend in prize picks, and I told you I like those combo plays. I, I like it when you can combine guys from a couple different teams and you're watching both games with interest. So, I won this one. This was a, a $50 power play. So this won 250 bucks. And it was a, it was three receiver combos. So I had Missouri's Luther Burden, Jaden Bray from Oklahoma State. Would they get more than 140 and a half receiving yards? So those two, the next combo was Texas's Xavier Worthy, Washington State's Kyle Williams, 143 and a half for them. And then the next one was Devontae Walker, from North Carolina, Tez Walker, and J.P. Richardson from TCU, would they combine for more than 120 and a half? All of them hit. So that was a big win for me. That was a good one. I did not have as good of a time with my quarterback combos. Uh, Drake May and Jackson Dart. So Drake May from UNC, Jackson, Jackson Dart from Ole Miss, more than five and a half combined pass rush receiving touchdowns. That was great. But Bo Nix from Oregon, Brady Cook from Mizzou, despite both of them winning and playing very good games, did not exceed five combined touchdowns. Jordan Travis and Caleb Williams also did not exceed five and a half combined touchdowns. They had four. Bodix, Brady Cook had five, but did not exceed it. So that was a loss for me. You win some, you lose some, but you always have fun. And with prize picks, it is fantastic. Download the prize picks app. Use the code Andy. They will match your first deposit up to $100. That code is Andy. They match you up to $100. If you deposit $100, they deposit $100. Deposit $50, they deposit $50. 
Also, until October 24th, there is a basically free square to celebrate the start of the NBA season. If Steph Curry scores one point on the Warriors opening night, you win that square. So you hop on that square and then you can grab some more. You can play as many as five, as few as two. And that one pretty much already got in the bag. So they've got games. If, if, if someone is playing a sport, prize picks probably has some squares. Obviously tons of NFL, NBA starting this week. You got all kinds of action and all kinds of ways to be deeply invested, very interested in all these games. They're available in Florida, Texas, and California, multiple other states. Prize picks, download the app, use the code Andy, and they will match your first deposit up to $100. All right, it is time for best case and worst case scenarios. What is the absolute best possible outcome for your team? What is the worst possible outcome for your team? That got shaped a little better this weekend. I think we have a little better idea. So we're going to do it for quite a few teams. We will start with the game that I attended in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Let's start with the team that won, the Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama fell behind in the first half. Tennessee punches in a touchdown late in the half to go up 20-7. to seven. It is feeling like things are done for Alabama, that their chances to play in the SEC championship game could be slipping because if they lose to Tennessee, they could probably lose to LSU, probably lose to somebody else down the stretch. Maybe, maybe they go to Auburn and lose. The way Tennessee was playing, the way Alabama was playing, it did not look like Alabama wanted to be involved in the SEC or national title races. And that completely flipped in the second half. Alabama came out on fire in the second half. Here's Nick Saban on what he said to the Tide. Obviously a pretty fun second half. Uh, really proud of our players. Uh, when I walked in at halftime after they scored right before the half, I said, everybody here has got a choice, you know, a choice to make. Um, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do? Um, everybody's got to choose what they want. And we went out and scored in two plays on the second in the second half in the first drive on offense. And Changed the momentum of the game and, you know, played really well from that time on. And, you know, Tennessee's got a really good team. And, you know, I'm really proud of our players for the way they competed in the game and came back and the way they took care of business in the second half. Alabama just dominated that second half. The, the, the two-play drive to start, the defense played well, the, the strip sack that was recovered for a touchdown, everything was going right for them. And they look, in the second half, like a team – that can win the SEC, that can play for the national title. And that's the thing. You get that a quarter at a time, half at a time from this Alabama team. You don't get it all the time. And I think that's frustrating for Alabama fans who are used to a lot more consistency from their team. But the thing about it is the reason this team seems capable of this is they, they genuinely seem to get along. Everybody seems to love each other. Here's Jalen Milrow, Alabama's quarterback on how they reacted in this game. I think um, we had the same mindset the whole game. No matter what part of the game it was, we had the same mindset, and the mindset was to win, you know? And I think as a collective whole, we all approached it as a challenge going into the game, and it factored into how we approached every situation that took place, whether it was good, bad, or ugly. We all channeled in and figured out that we can win this thing, you know what I'm saying? So our, our mindset, was all just to um, be on the same page and be uh, be successful. For those first two plays to start the second half, scripted and what made it work so well there? Uh, I, I don't think it was, it, it was just just our uh, point of attack, you know, just a, just a acknowledging the assignment that took place and just executing the best of our ability. Every win's big. So these guys don't feel as kind of rigid and militaristic as most Alabama football teams. They, they seem to have a little more personality and they do genuinely seem to like one another. And I think that probably helps them when they get in these adverse situations and helps them kind of play their way out of them. It's very interesting hearing Nick Saban talk about this team because you can tell he is enjoying coaching this team, even though it is not what 
he would normally expect to have. It's not necessarily up to his standard in terms of consistency or dominance, but he seems to really like these guys. And you could tell after that game how much fun he was having. And he's he's cracking jokes afterward. Oh, I love it. You know, it's been great. The challenges are great. I enjoy coaching this team. Um, uh, that's not to say that they're taking years off of my life, but I'm okay. They probably are. Because this team does make you nervous. But here's the deal. Everything is still in front of this Alabama team. Every single thing. The best case scenario is a national championship. It's easy to say that this team, playing the way it has, will never win a national championship. And it's true. It will have to be better four quarters at a time to win a national championship. But it has the, the raw materials. It has the talent. It's just a matter of whether these guys can play well enough for an extended enough period of time to make that work. What's the worst case scenario from Alabama? The worst case is they lose to LSU and they don't win the SEC West. And this is kind of a, an also ran type season, which still could wind up being a 10 and two year, but it, it wouldn't satisfy anybody in Tuscaloosa. 10 and two, nine and three is not going to make anybody happy. But if they win the SEC West, if they go to the, the SEC championship game, they're probably going to play Georgia. Then it's a one game scenario to get into the college football playoff to possibly compete for the national title. This team, especially because We've seen Georgia be inconsistent too. This team on the right day can pull that off. Nick Saban, they're going to potentially make him tear his hair out, but they're also making him smile. It's a very interesting team. It's not, I would say, not the kind of team most Alabama fans are used to, to enjoying, but I imagine if they, if they, Take that part away. Take being accustomed to their team just steamrolling everybody. This particular group is a lot of fun. So best case for Alabama, national championship. Worst case, an unsatisfying 10-2 and two or 9-3, and three, which most, most people would take, but not at Alabama. Next up, the team Alabama vanquished the Tennessee Vols. So... I caught up with Austin Price from VolQuest after the game. We talked about what happens next for Tennessee. Best case for Tennessee is they beat Kentucky, they beat Missouri, and they beat Georgia. That would be a huge season. That would put them at 10-2. and two. Would they win the East? Maybe not. Probably not because Georgia would have to lose another one because Tennessee already has two, two losses in SEC play. But it would be a huge year. It would be considered probably forward progress for Josh Heupel's program. Anything else? So losing to Georgia, being nine and three, I think that would be considered a little step back. I think losing another one of those that puts you at eight and four, I think that's probably the floor for this season is eight and four. And it is a step back from what they had. But Joe Milton, not as good of a quarterback as Hendon Hooker, and that really feels like the difference, is, is that Hendon Hooker, you put him on this team, it's a little bit better. With Joe Milton, it's just not. And so potentially Nico Yamamealava, when he comes of age and he's seasoned and is the starting quarterback, maybe he's that guy that takes them the next step. But they still have a chance to do some special stuff this season. They're playing – Kentucky this week. I don't, I, I feel like Tennessee's a bad matchup for Kentucky as currently constituted. It's Missouri. I worry about a little more for Tennessee. That's the one that I think could, could handle Tennessee. Georgia obviously is Georgia. They're going to have to play their best game if they want to beat Georgia, even at Neyland Stadium. Even if that stadium is completely rocking, they're going to have to play great to beat Georgia because they are a bad style matchup. Georgia is a bad style matchup for Tennessee, but they can do it. So here is Austin talking Tennessee, best and worst case. Here with Austin Price of VolQuest.com. And Austin, Tennessee up at the half, everything going for them. They score a touchdown late, and then it just all falls apart in the second half. Yeah, at halftime, to quote the great Denny Green, they had them right where they want them, and they <laughs> let them off the hook. You know, yeah. I mean, like, you know, uh, you know I mean, it, 
for Tennessee fans, this was a hard one to swallow. It's two quarters. Second quarter at Florida, third quarter at Bama. Um, Alabama made adjustments. Credit to them. I yeah. mean, they made plays in the second half. And uh, Tennessee did not. And then Hypo going forward on fourth down on his side of the 50 twice. When Jackson Ross looked like <laughs> Ray Guy out there yeah. times tonight, probably not the, me- the best move. Well, and, and I know Tennessee fans, I, I was watching Twitter, I was watching the message boards, not happy about the offici- officiating. You, you asked Josh Heupel about that. Well, they shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, I asked him about it. I said, did you feel like it was one-sided? He just stared at me. It seemed like at points in the second half, your defenders were having to play two-hand touch, and they were allowed to play more combat out there. I mean, did you feel like that it was a bit one-sided? Next question, yeah. Was that long enough silence? Yeah. And, 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 and then said next question after about 10, 10 to 12 seconds and then said, was that long enough silence for you? In other words, he's pissed. Yeah, I don't and want to I get mean, fined, like, basically. You know, and, and yeah, correct. He doesn't want to get fined. I would have taken the fine. Like, it, it, was, it was blatant tonight. Again, that's not why Tennessee lost. Alabama made, made some adjustments. They made plays. But to try to get the momentum back, it didn't help that Tennessee right. was having to play more than the 11 on the other side. But you know what? I mean, Tennessee's got to shake this off and, and, and get back to work because they got Kentucky next week. Kentucky – it's formidable. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a game Tennessee normally wins, and if Tennessee can win it, they'll be six and two uh, heading to November. It's only happened uh, once, and that was last year uh, since Phil Fulmer was fired in 2008. How does this team bounce back from this? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think that they've got a, a group of resilient kids. The problem is, is I think the passing game is somewhat limited, mm-hmm. just because Joe's you know still not putting together a full game. He had 175 in the first half, he had a little over 50 in the second, and a lot of it was kind of garbage yards yeah. there. You know, at the end. They, they've got to figure out a way to, to, to run the football next week. They didn't run it a real successful night outside of Joe with some design quarterback stuff. And, you know, if they can do that and play good defense again, they'll have a shot. Nick Saban said they, they changed things up. They, they'd done more odd front to start because they thought that was going to help them, but it turned out the even front stuff worked a lot better. It doesn't seem like Tennessee could adjust to that. No, they again, they Alabama made the adjustments in the second half. They were able to get pressure on Joe Milton, even when he was able to get passes away. He was affected, Andy, yeah. and and you know, you know, obviously the the scoop and score after the strip sack, you know, that's one thing. But I mean, Tennessee at that point was was down seven. They're trying to make something happen, and they just couldn't ever get any kind of momentum in the second half at all. So, uh, where are we at on this Tennessee team right now? Is this about what you thought this team would be right right here? In this yeah, part I thought of they'd season? go nine and three. Okay. Uh, I honestly thought they'd probably lose to, to Texas A&M at home. They beat a and I thought they'd win at Florida on the road. They didn't. Mm-hmm. So you flip those two. I thought they'd be right kind of right where they are. Um, you know, it's it's not a great Tennessee team. They found a way to win some games. Uh, they've got to find a way to win next week again. Being six and two heading into November, and they play UConn. They'll be seven and two going to Missouri. Another tough game. Yeah. Those Kentucky and Missouri games. That'll be the games that really determine the season. Whether they're nine and three or yeah. eight and four or seven and five, depending on kind of what they are in those top games. Is there a chance down the road that that Heupel sprinkles in a little more Nico as as they sort of move toward next season? I, you know, I don't think so unless they lose a game like next week. Like you lose next week. You're going into UConn, it's a perfect time, especially if Tennessee struggles to throw it next week. Uh, that's the perfect time to make the move to Nico. It's kind of the Tyler Bray move, right? You yeah. Know, except for you're a lot better record-wise than when Tyler Bray went in for Matt Sims. But, you know, I just don't think they're ready to go in that direction um, yet. But, again, it's a game-by-game basis. So, in terms of, of how this team is together, because it, it, it seems like after a loss like this, there, there's two things that can sure. happen. You either come together, fall apart, how good is this coaching staff at making sure they can stay together? Well, I, the real question I think is the offensive side because you know, you know, outside of Heupel and Glenn Ellerby, there's a lot of inexperience on the other, on the offensive side. Jerry Mack has coached a long time, but I mean, Kelsey Pope's in year two, Alec Ablin in year one, Joey Halls has coached a long time, but it's his first year as a coordinator, so he's in a different role. Um, the defensive side, I don't really worry about it. I mean, it's just straight veterans on that side. Mm-hmm. So again, I, I think that you know, leadership will be tested. Um, anytime you lose a game like this, especially the way you lost it, um, the, the defense probably feels like they were kind of left out there on an aisle. And when you go forward on you know your side of the 50 twice and don't get it either time, uh, that, that's that's tough for the defense. They felt like they were out there a whole lot tonight. Well, and, and it's interesting because the defense is very good, has been good all season, yeah, and does seem capable of, of creating game-changing plays. I wonder, with an offensive-minded head coach, can can he 
turn his thinking to say, play let the way? defense but he did be, last week. Be, exactly. Because it's the first game they had won where, where Josh Heupel hadn't scored 30 points. That's right. Or, so, or trailed it after. So can he grow as a head coach in that way? Because, you know, UCF, you didn't have to. You were just you were scoring on everybody. Yeah. But in this league, you, you're going to have games like that where you got to let your defense, if it's playing well, do what it does. Well, that and they've got to learn to, you know, the short yardage stuff. That was yeah. really something they were really good at last year with Carvin yeah. and, and Darnell Wright. This year, <laughs> it's a struggle bus on short yardage. It was against AM. It was again tonight on those two fourth and ones. In this league, you've got to get a third and one or a fourth and one to extend a drive, to put to close out a game. And so, like, they've, they've got to be better now. I don't know why they don't do the touche push. Joe's 6'5 and oh, he's huge. 30 pounds. It, but they don't have the, the under center stuff in the offense, right? Well, they do. They did a year they, ago. I can't okay. imagine that they don't. I mean, yeah. they did a year ago when they would line up Hannon under center and Hannon to true. Princeton. You're fans. right. You're right. You know, I, I, I don't really understand. I guess I'm just that, – that's where – and I probably asked the hype a lot on Monday, like, you, you're not going under center at all. Why? Like, yeah. you know, is there a justification for it? Now, back to your question about the defense. Like, you know, the defense up front, really, really good. Linebacker, I think they really still miss Keenan Peely to a degree. He hoping to get back in the month of November. Maybe Missouri. He's a little bit ahead of schedule. We'll see. And then, uh, and then the back end. You know, I mean, I, I thought all kind of all offseason, Jalen McCullough. I mean, like he, he you know, is, is he a liability? Is he not? I mean, he's played solid this year. I mean, like he really has. And he and Wesley Walker, and then Kamal Haddon's playing some of his best football. Tennessee's got to get a figure it out on the defensive side because they've got to be able to lean on that going forward i think that's just the team they are yeah and against kentucky you got to stop the run yep and they can affect they can affect devin leary that yeah. i don't think there's a question about well, that they can shut down the run i mean yeah. they do a nice job against the run i mean since these defensive fronts are really formidable i think kentucky coming off a bye they're gonna have to scheme some stuff up because i think that that what they do well is what tennessee does well defensively which means it could be a, a tougher night for Kentucky. Yeah, you know, next Just week. It's a bad matchup, kind unless of you know, coming off a bye helps them, and it yeah. could. Tennessee's coming off Bama, they're coming off a bye. Yeah, well, it, it feels like a very crucial stretch sure. coming up for the Vols. We'll have to see what happens. Thank you, Austin. You're welcome, Andy. Appreciate it. That's Austin Price from VolQuest. Next up, we head to the Big Ten. The biggest game of the weekend with the highest stakes was obviously. Ohio State and Penn State. The Buckeyes come out on top. They had Marvin Harrison Jr. Penn State didn't. That feels like the biggest difference in that game, but Penn State's offense in general looked sluggish, looked like they didn't have dynamic receivers who could separate. It was it was a big problem. Ohio State's offense was not what it could have been, but you also know they're missing Emeka Buka, they're missing Travion Henderson, and it could get better. J.D. Piquel, Host of the hard count. You know him. You love him from on three. He was at that game. We talked to him about Ohio State and Penn State and their best and worst case scenarios. Joined by J.D. Piquel, the great from on three, host of the hard count. J.D., you were in Columbus, Ohio. You watched Ohio State beat Penn State on Saturday. We're going to do best case and worst case for the Buckeyes and for the Nittany Lions, and we'll start with the victors. Well, okay, we probably shouldn't use that term for Ohio State, but we will start with the Buckeyes. That was, I thought, an impressive way to gut it out offensively against a very good defense while shorthanded. Yeah, it was, it was one of those things, too, where, like, at personnel on the line of scrimmage, I kind of thought would favor Penn State more than it did. Did. But even so, like it was so vintage Big Ten where we're yeah. going back and forth and nobody can score. And then, like, it, it was awesome for Ohio State just to be like, well, actually, we have uh, an Avenger playing wide receiver for us. So we're going <laughs> to yes. throw the ball to him and just kind of have that be how we win this football game. So, uh, I mean, I think best case for Ohio State, it's, it's funny to say because it's not the Ohio State team that we have come to know over the past couple of years where they're scoring scoring 40 a game and you know the quarterbacks in the Heisman Trophy conversation. But like I think the best case scenario for Ohio State at this point in time, it's hard to say that it's not at the very least uh, a national championship a appearance. I think that's probably the best case. I, I probably need to see a little bit more to put them in the national championship winning category just yet. And it's a, it's a small sample size. I still think the offense probably has to be a little more potent. But I think best case right now, uh, is a national title appearance, which would be saying something and I'm sure would be a, a nice hump to get over for Ryan Day and company. And I agree with you on Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, th 
that was the biggest difference in the game was they had Marvin Harrison Jr. and Penn State didn't have any dynamic receivers who could get open and get separation. The just how smooth he is, how much he affected because I think the biggest play of the game was one where he did not get thrown the ball. It was Kalen King getting called for the hold, which was a hold, and it wipes the 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 scoop and score off the board. And that's all Marvin Harrison Jr. because you're so scared of what he can do to you. And I was surprised they didn't show him a little more attention the majority of the game. Like when they got down near that high red, low red area, they gave him a little more attention over the top. But for the most part, they just let those corners play with him. Like it was Kalen King and it was Johnny Dixon. And I didn't see him travel a ton in terms of, you know, having to be Kalen King, you're matched up with him, traveling wherever he goes. Like, and, and they, they did an okay job. It's funny to say that looking at the box score, but I mean, hat tip to Penn State being like, we're going to trust our guys on the island and let them play. And I mean, you can only do that so long until Marvin Harrison Jr. gets his. So yeah, I mean, it was overall like he was and is the difference for Ohio State and probably needs to be going forward as, as Kyle McCord continues to uh, get his feet stable under him. So you, you mentioned best case is, is a national title game appearance. And I, I, I do think the way everybody's playing this year, their best case probably is a national title, period. The question is, can they beat Michigan if, say, Travion Henderson's back, Emeka Buka's back? It feels like that version of the offense has a better chance. But it's so hard to say because Michigan just destroys everybody, but they haven't really played anybody good. And that's the thing I'm wondering, too. I think Urban Meyer made a really good point on Big Noon a couple of weeks ago. Like, if you're the same team in November as you are in September, like, we we got problems. So, like, everybody yeah. else, the, the the metaphor for me is, like, everybody else is lifting heavy weight right now. Notre Dame's lifting the 45s playing Notre Dame. They're, they're squatting heavy playing Penn State. And Michigan's, like, trying to find a way to get strong for November using, like, resistance bands during the year, Andy. Like, you get to November, and it's just it's very, very difficult to simulate that kind of – resistance so i mean it's a uh, low weight high reps i suppose is what you would say but i think yeah. i think you're exactly right like michigan and ohio state uh curious to see the trend right there because that is obviously the question uh that defines success for both sides it's crazy to say the worst case scenario is a is an 11 and one record but yeah. it probably is and the problem with ohio state and and you know ryan day i think he says all the right things about this where it's expected, you're expected to win every game, you're expected to beat your rival, blah, 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 blah. But the fact of the matter is, the worst case scenario for this team probably is 11-1. and one. They've lost to Michigan for a third straight year, and everybody's really mad at Ryan Day, even though they're 11-1. and one. And who's to say they don't still find their way in the college football playoff like they did mm -hmm. last year? Like with how much chaos we had last year, it feels like we're setting up for – potentially more chaos when it comes to November and early December this year. So uh, even if they do go 11 and one, it would not be surprising if they found themselves in that final four. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. If, if they are getting healthy too, because we, we don't exactly know how long it's going to take them to get healthy, but that's a situation where they will have had a month to get completely healthy, where if they have all their weapons, we saw it last year. They played much better against Georgia in the Peach Bowl than they played against Michigan in the regular season finale. So this is a team that can do that and can turn it on. But I am sure everybody in Columbus would rather they just go ahead and beat Michigan in that little streak where it stands and go ahead into the Big Ten championship game. Uh, what do they have to do to be good enough to beat Michigan at the end of the year? Yeah, that's a that's a tremendous question. It's sort of a, a cop-out answer because we've been saying it now for the last couple of weeks. It's why I picked them to lose to Notre Dame and lose to Penn State and then came in Sunday morning with a sheepish grin saying, well, I guess I was wrong on Ohio State. But mm -hmm. it really does feel like – I keep crying wolf here, but it really does feel like there has to be this evolution of an offense to be able to put pressure on a Michigan to score points because it feels like Michigan's taking that next step offensively or they're in the process of doing that with the way that – J.J. McCarthy is trending so far this year. So I do think there will be a game at some point in time for Ohio State if they want to beat Michigan or if they want to win a national title even. Uh, I think they have to be potent offensively to the point where they can put the pressure on you to score points. We saw that yesterday, even though it was kind of a rock fight at the end of the game where they're just like, all right, get the ball to 18 and that's going to be how we live. Yeah. Um, if they get healthy and they can be potent, I think that could really be the difference maker. Yeah, and I, I think – 
with Abuka, it takes so much pressure off Harrison. The fact that Harrison could do what he did against a defense like that without Abuka on the field. The the one guy I thought was was very helpful to him and impressive was Cade Stover. He made a couple tough yeah. catches, uh, converted some uh, some some third downs, and you, you got to have that other target or everyone will just kind of swarm the star. It feels like Cade Stover gives them that other option. But again, if they have Travion Henderson, they can hand off to. If they have a Mecca Buka, we're talking about a completely different scenario. It it makes me very excited for that game. For for this is, you know, Ohio State Michigan has been a huge game. The last, well, take 2020 out when they didn't play, but but really since 2018, you have two wins on each side. But man, this feels different. This feels like the one who wins this one maybe the national champ and it feels like the degrees of separation to Andy are maybe a little bit less like approaching the game and I don't know that I mean Michigan went into Columbus last year and they were I mean I think they were like a touchdown dog maybe something like that when they played Ohio State but like I'm curious to see what that line is come game time for this one because I mean it really is with the way Ohio State's trending and how good Michigan is right now we know about them like it is it's gonna be uh it'll be a blockbuster that's for sure it will be amazing now we got to talk about the other team on the field in Columbus, Penn State. I'm going to once again apologize to everybody because I was the one who said all offseason, Penn State's going to win the Big Ten. This is the year that they got the dudes that make them close enough to Ohio State and to Michigan to do that. No. They do not have receivers who can separate against that type of competition. It showed they could not do anything offensively. The defense played about as well as you can expect. But I, they, they seem really limited offensively. J.D., the, the best-case scenario for them, I, I'm wondering, after watching, can we even say the best case is they beat Michigan at home, or do we think that's even a possibility anymore? I think it is. I think that is still a possibility just by nature of it being in Happy Valley. Like we, we left Columbus yesterday, and we had a fair amount of windshield time, myself and, and our producer, Trey, Anity, and we were just talking like, Man, if that game's not in the shoe, I don't know if, if Penn State wins, but do we see like more competent offensive play? Do we see Drew Aller a little bit more settled down? Not even saying they win the football game, just saying maybe, just maybe you have a different final score that's a little bit more respectable for the Penn State offense. And so with it being in State College, with it being truly, I mean, the first real test for Michigan, like that'll be the first heavyweight they have to lift all season. Like I think that could kind of, play an advantage for for Penn State because I think we saw especially in the early going even though nobody was really taking gash plays out of either side like you could tell hey Ohio State they've they've played somebody Michigan they played Iowa and Iowa was a good defense but like I think there was a little bit of that oh whoa hey okay this is a different this is a different uh difficulty level here that we're playing at so I wonder how that factors in I think best case for me for Penn State is a college football playoff appearance and I know that's probably asking for a lot to happen um, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility, especially if things go their way and they have their best game uh, at home against Michigan. Yeah, and, and what you'd need, obviously, in that scenario was you, you would need Michigan to go then beat Ohio State, Penn State win the tiebreaker. All of these things are possible. I think the hardest part of that is Penn State beating Michigan. What can they do offensively? What needs to improve other than the obvious receivers get separation? But who who might be able to engineer those improvements between now and November 11th yeah you know I think some of it too goes back to and this is again sort of the obvious answer I mean outside of the wide receiver position you look at Drew Aller like how how much can he mature how much does he learn from this game you know at Ohio State and that kind of road atmosphere Um, I think the tight end play for for Penn State too what we saw Cade Stover be for for Ohio State yesterday kind of making the the middle of the field something that he kind of took over in a lot of different games or a lot of different situations like that jump ball over the middle where he just I mean little boy that I think it was a Penn State safety or linebacker I forget who it was but like just essentially made the middle of the field his deal I mean if Penn State can have some guys step up weapon wise at that position group and and have them be a little bit more consistent and be an option for Drew Aller you wonder if maybe that settles him down a little bit more so there's probably you know a lot of small answers to to equate to a big solution would be my guess but um i mean i think at, at the end of the day 
the thing that was missing yesterday was the run game for Penn State. And I mean, we, we saw Ohio State said, if you're going to beat us, it's got to be Drew Aller. And credit Ohio State holding them to less than 100 yards rushing and making them throw it 40 times a game. I mean, if, if they're able to run the football, I don't know if we have the same conversation around Drew Aller going like 18 for 43 or whatever it was. So kind of a multifaceted answer there for you, Andy. But outside of the obvious of the wide receiver stepping up, I think the run game, and I think the tight ends being able to be a more viable option is where I look first. And I think if they run the ball, it's a very different game because the time of possession is so different. And that's the part – they just have to be able to move people. I don't know if they're going to be able to move Michigan. Now let's talk worst case. And, and with Penn State, the worst case is probably one of those where if we told it to another fan base, they'd be like, well, that doesn't sound so bad. But if you, if you tell it to the Penn State fan base, it's like, oh, God, this again – the, the worst case for Penn State probably is 10 and 2. You've lost to Ohio State. You got killed by Michigan. That would be the, the, the worst part because there's, there's degrees of the Michigan game. You could win it and things are still in front of you. You can lose it in a competitive fashion and you go, you know what? Okay, that's fine. That's something to build on. Drew Aller's back, 12 team playoff next year. But if you get blown out by Michigan at home, and the offense still looks pedestrian, that's when you go, are we ever going to get off this plateau? Because even if the playoff expands, yeah, you're going to get in, but you're probably going to get in going on the road, having to play somebody tough right away that you're you're still not equipped to beat because you don't have a dynamic offense. Andy, I have uh, sort of garnered a reputation a little bit, and you know, I've talked about this, about maybe being uh, your neighborhood hope dealer. You know, you know <laughs> that's having, right. Uh, First, first taste enjoying, is free, baby. Enjoying a little bit of hopium now and then. I'm, I'm going to kind of go away from that right now. I think the worst case for Penn State is 9-3. and three. I was pulling up the schedule, and okay. they play at Maryland. Classic mm. look-ahead spot right before Michigan. Oh, and Ohio we're, State we're knows talking, how that feels. Talking, it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky spot. I mean, they're scoring points. You know, we, we saw what Drew Aller was on the road. Maybe College Park gets into it just a little bit. I mean, if we're talking worst case scenario, you get the look ahead versus, and you and you see maybe the first like real turnover prone situation from Drew Aller, which we haven't seen yet. You wonder if that still is out there, and if it shows up in that game, that's not the team you want to do it against. So a, a lot of factors would would play into that. But I think nine and three would again be. I mean, the Baylor Bears in Waco, Texas, where I'm coming from, like they would love to be nine and three today. Uh, they would sign on the dotted line right now if you showed that to them. But uh, I think that's probably the worst case for Penn State, given uh, the way this, the schedule shakes out. And their fans would consider that a complete disaster yep. for this season with this roster, with this level of talent. And it, it, it would be an, an incredibly frustrating situation because as frustrated as Ohio State fans are, that they've lost to Michigan two years in a row. They realistically were one defensive stop away from playing for the national title last year. And they probably would have won it had they made it to that game. So they're not on the ledge. The Penn State fans, they're on the ledge, but the problem is the drop is one foot. It doesn't do anything to you because you're just sort of in the same place over and over and over again. And I, I, I realize the people like the Baylor fans, the Florida fans, all of those people are like, what are you guys complaining about? But for the Penn State fans, it's like, we want to feel something. Just want to just want to know what it feels like to be alive, you know? Just want to want yeah. to get out of this this groundhog day. And you, you can't blame them. You can't blame them. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it, it's incredible. And and you could just see the looks on everybody's faces as that game slipped away yesterday, where you you just you feel for that group because you thought they were right there. And look, I'm I am more guilty of it than anyone, I think. And sometimes you're just you're just not there yet, and you have to you have to get over the hump. So Penn State, watch out for Maryland. Figure it out against Michigan. Otherwise, the treadmill continues. Groundhog Day continues. You're punching Ned Ryerson in the face over and over and over again. And I'm just sorry, JD. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Andy. Thanks to JD and that. Penn State one is is the toughest one to say and the toughest one, I think, for the fan base to stomach of, of these that we're going through this weekend because it just – it felt like this could be the year that they had 
the kind of elite talent that would allow them to be competitive with Ohio State and, and Michigan. But nothing we saw on Saturday suggests they're going to be competitive with Michigan either, that they're going to be able to move the ball on them. Maybe they surprise us, but they're they're the one whose ceiling feels like it's it's lowered. Everybody else that we're talking about, it feels like their ceiling has risen. That includes another team in the Big Ten. I bet you forgot about Nebraska. If you're not a Nebraska fan, I bet you stopped thinking about Nebraska after they got shelled by Michigan. And I understand that. But in Matt Rule's first season, the Huskers are actually in a pretty good spot. They went out and beat Illinois on a Friday night. On Saturday, they beat Northwestern 17-9. It was an ugly game. Nebraska is very limited offensively because of injuries. But they are 4-3 and three right now. The idea of a bowl eligible Nebraska feels very possible, but there's actually even more that Nebraska could potentially do depending on just how mediocre the rest of the Big Ten West wants to be. Sean Callahan of Husker Online joined me to break down all the possibilities for the Cornhuskers. We're joined now by Sean Callahan of, of Husker Online. Nebraska, 17-9 winner against Northwestern on Saturday. Nebraska now 4-3. and three. And, Sean, we're doing best-case and worst-case scenarios. And I was listening to Will Compton do an interview last week. And, you know, proud Cornhusker. And he was spinning out a scenario where Nebraska wins the Big Ten West. And I was like, ah, come on. But after what we saw yesterday, which was not pretty, but it was a win, and Iowa losing – I can kind of see the path. Yeah, you, you look at this West division right now. Not one offense yesterday put up 400 yards of offense. I think Wisconsin was the high water mark, just under 400. Iowa almost won with what 127 yards of offense yes. yesterday. So two um, yards in the second half. Two. I mean, you look at the West. It's it's a lot of teams with new coaches and, and I think five teams that have had quarterback injuries or quarterback changes. So it, it's just a disaster on offense. Um, a, a lot of just transitional teams right now. And, and Nebraska is so limited right now, but give Matt real credit. He's embraced what this team is. They've got a very good defense. They've got pretty good special teams and they've got an offense that's lost four of its top five receivers and two of its top three running backs. And they have a change at quarterback right now. I mean, and they're, featuring a tight end that's had two major knee injuries, Thomas Fedoni. So uh, it's about as limited of a unit as I've seen in my time covering Nebraska. And, you know, there's been some teams over the last 20 plus years that have struggled, but nothing like this in terms of what they have available. It's crazy because it's, it clearly was not rules intent to play the same style as everybody else in the West. It's just worked out that way because their defense is very good and has stayed relatively healthy compared to the offense yeah i think if this team would have been at full strength you would make a case right now they they, they would win this west division if they had their full yeah. team i mean they have they had as good of receivers as anybody in the division and they had great running back depth but um yeah rule i i think and he said this when he came here he's like look when i went to baylor i adjusted i adapted to the big 12 when i was at temple i adapted to that league and um, he's not one of those coaches. He's not 2004 Bill Callahan trying to force the West Coast offense um, to to Nebraska with Joe Daly at quarterback. He's really um, embraced kind of what they are. And Heiner Carberg's going to have to carry a big load. As a quarterback, he's going to have to carry it 15-plus times a game. Um, that's probably not where he wants to be as an offense, but that that's he's their, one of their best weapons right now. And losing Billy Kemp yesterday, Andy, that was Ooh. humongous. Because uh, he was their veteran number one receiver, we don't know how long he's out for. It sounds like it's not a end of the season type deal, but how many weeks will that potential MCL knee injury, what rule called after the game, keep him out for? Yeah, and and that's the thing is is they're going to have to stitch this all together. But you look at the schedule; they can beat Purdue. Now they can lose any of these games too. So let's 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 remember that. But they can beat Purdue, the Michigan State Maryland thing. You know. Those teams from the East, they've probably, if they want to win the West, they've probably got to win both of those. But interestingly enough, it, it's funny because we're we're talking pie in the sky here, winning the West. If they beat Purdue and they split Michigan State and Maryland, they're bowl eligible. How long has Nebraska been waiting for that? Yeah, you think about 2016, they went to Nashville. That was their last bowl trip. And 
I'll tell you what, I, I think a lot of Husker fans would kill for a trip to Nashville or Vegas for a bowl game right now. Just after what, you know, you think about the Scott Frost there, that was the home run of coaching hires. Like, this cannot fail. They never went to a bowl game once under Scott Frost. They could have gone in 2020. The players oh. actually voted not to go to the bowl in 2020 after Scott Frost lobbied to play football in 2020 and took a lot of heat for it at that time. Um, so, yeah, a bowl game of any kind, if it's in Detroit or if it's in Vegas or Nashville or New York, wherever, I think Rutgers, by the way, would be a lock at this point going to the pinstripe yeah. bowl, getting their sixth win. That just makes too much sense. But um, I think anyone here would just crave and, and they need these practices, Andy. They haven't had those yes. 15 bowl practices um, since that 2016 season. Well, and OK, we'll we'll do the worst case scenario. I know nobody wants to hear that they can lose any of these games on their schedule because they're so limited on offense. How do they keep that part from happening? Like, cause we want to, you know, you want to be your best, but if they can just hit in the middle, like we just said, get to six wins, how do they make sure they get to six wins? They got to run the ball effectively close to 200 yards in a game. And they can do that. Um, by the way, Northwestern only blitzed twice yesterday. So teams are not blitzing Nebraska anymore. They they know Harburg is effective as a runner. Um, so they're not going to let him have those long QB scramble runs because they're blitzing him because um, he can outrun your blitz. He's that fast. So the running game is going to be challenging. Also, Ethan Piper, one of their top offensive linemen, went out yet yesterday, possibly for the season. Same um, play so as Billy Kemp, right? Yeah, it was a two-for-one deal. Two, two of their top veteran guys went out on one play. Um, their center, Ben Scott, went out for three plays, came back in the game. Um, so, you know, that offensive line's a big part of it. Uh, they played okay, but I just don't know how they're going to draw it up at receiver. They're going to play true three true freshmen and a walk-on from Omaha who was just put on scholarship and Alex Bullock. He's their number one right now. Wow. But they are they're doing it. They're winning. This is a winning streak. The old people will remember from Major League, Lou Brown, explaining what that means to people. Uh, and at Nebraska, they haven't had many of those lately. It feels like Matt Rule is starting to to get the buy-in he wants, the the you know the temperament he wants, even if they don't have the personnel that they need right now. Yeah, you can sense the belief, the buy-in um, to Matt Rule with his team. And and you saw it in the locker room. I don't know if you saw the video, Andy. They did a uh, – he, he did like a crowd surf, jumped on the team, and they lift him in the air. Um, and, and, and these guys love Coach Rule. I mean, he's demanding, but these players want that. They're tired of losing here. When you have 90,000 people show up to your games every week and there's 50 media members at every availability and you have to keep talking about not winning, it gets old. And these players want to win. They want to be pushed by a coach that knows how to push them and has a proven track record. And, and Matt Rule has really done that. And I think there's a buy-in right now. Yeah, and I go back to something. Uh, I talked to him in the spring, and he said he felt like Nebraska, it was more like year two at Baylor or year two at Temple. It wasn't as big of a teardown job as those jobs. And you thought, okay, are you sure about that, especially with the way the season started? But I, I think he may be right. I, I think – this could end on a very positive note, and then you build on that. Well, there were a lot of recruiting classes that were on this roster that were 25-ish ranked type classes, you know, quality players. They just weren't developed, and they just weren't coached right. They weren't played right. Matt Rules figured out a way to get more out of some of these guys that just weren't contributing, and, and it's on the defensive side of the ball. You're seeing a lot of these players like Ty Robinson, Nash Hutmacher, the nose tackle, is playing at an all-Big Ten level whether it's yeah. like a second or third team, but he had two and a half sacks on the nose. I mean, they, they are getting a ton out of that defense, much more than anybody could have projected. And granted, it is the Big Ten West, so they're not seeing great offenses, but uh, they made some big-time plays in the game against Northwestern on Saturday. It's going to be fun to watch because if they get to six wins, that fan base is going to be deliriously happy. But if they can make a run, and, and this is – my thing was with Iowa – if they were going to keep winning that way, and when it, when he returned the punt, I thought, okay, well, that's it. They're they're going to they're just going to keep winning this way. But Minnesota showed you they can be beaten. That defense and special teams so, doesn't always come through necessarily. And Nebraska did beat them last year with an interim staff. Like it feels like there's a there's a chance. I I don't want to get everybody too excited. And honestly, from a viewership standpoint, 
I don't know if I want to see Nebraska <laughs> against Michigan or Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game. But can you imagine what that would be like? <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, if you're being honest, you're like, yeah, all right, if they got to seven, eight wins, played well, and didn't make it to Indy, that's probably the, the best case scenario. Maybe the plane breaks down and be like, ah, you just go ahead and go to the playoff. We'll see you just there. Take, just take it, go. Yeah, exactly, because I don't know if anybody in the West, and it looked like Wisconsin, I mean, in Wisconsin could still play itself back in this thing, but they don't have the quarterback yeah. play right now. And Braylon right. Allen's shoulder, I mean, how much can he take? You know, he he had a lot of carries yesterday, but it seems like he's battled a lot of bumps and bruises where they can only lean on him so much when you know he looks like he's the best offensive player in the West, but they can only give him so many carries a game. Yeah. And so Nebraska, the the path is there. And it feels honestly like the worst case scenario is bowl eligibility, which I think people should feel pretty good about. Sean Callahan, thank you so much. Hey, thank you very much, Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you to Sean Callahan. It's it's crazy to think about the Nebraska in the Big Ten championship game, but it is mathematically possible and not really outside the realm of real possibility. That they're going to have to play pretty well. They're going to have to overcome some some limitations personnel wise on offense because of injuries. But it's not the craziest idea. Not right now. Here's another potentially crazy scenario. When Kansas State lost to Missouri and then lost to Oklahoma State, the idea of them repeating as Big 12 champions seemed completely foreign, seemed incredibly crazy. It's not so crazy now. Against Texas Tech, they bring in Avery Johnson, the five-star freshman quarterback, played him a bunch. He scores five touchdowns. Then they go into TCU week, not sure what they're going to do at QB. Chris Kleiman's pretty cagey about it. Does the the or with Will Howard and Avery Johnson on the depth chart? Well, we'll talk to Derek Young about what they did. He's from K-State Online. The solution, an elegant one, and it led to a huge win against TCU and some very intriguing possibilities for the Wildcats going forward. Here's Derek. We welcome Derek Young of K-State Online. And Derek is trying to figure out the team he covers. Because when last Derek and I talked, Kansas State was trying to figure out what to do at quarterback because Avery Johnson had played a breakout game against Texas Tech, gotten K-State back in the win column. So what were they going to do? Juggle Avery Johnson and Will Howard, make a decision. Derek, they started them both. Yeah, it, it seemed like a troll job by Chris Kleiman and Colin Klein because we were, you know, covering all week. We probably did like what ten different articles, all these different shows talking about the quarterback situation, who's going to start, and they're like, you know what, we'll just start them both. That'll be that'll be a good trivia question in a few years. Assuming Avery Johnson is who we think he's eventually going to be from a college football player, his first start came as a wide receiver. So um, <laughs> that that's that's interesting in itself. And obviously they got the win. That's the most important thing for if you're Chris Klein and if you're Colin Klein, you went 41 to three. So your defense is also kind of starting to figure it out. But in the end, one of my takeaways, too, was like, I know they probably don't care because the result is the result. But they kind of made it probably even more difficult on themselves because Will Howard seemed to be starting to figure it out a bit. And Avery Johnson still showed those flashes that show that he's going to be special. Well, the thing is, as long as it works, it doesn't matter. It's it's one of those, if it doesn't work and if the switching sort of bogs the offense down, that's when everybody's going to start complaining again. But they've got another game against Houston where Houston's coming off that crazy game against Texas. Before that, they played the the Hail Mary game against West Virginia. So they've, they've had an emotional roller coaster the last couple of weeks. K-State has a chance to settle this down, win this game, and then potentially go into Austin with a chance to get the pole, get pole position for a spot in the Big 12 title game if they could pull the upset. Yeah, and you don't have to squint too hard to see that kind of unfold either because, you know, unlike a lot of the games that Kansas State has played this year, they're probably getting Houston at the right time. Like, you can make an argument they got UCF at the wrong time, even though they won. Oklahoma State the wrong time. Texas Definitely Tech Oklahoma State the wrong, the wrong time. Yeah, yeah, Texas Tech at the wrong time. Even TCU at the wrong time because people thought they maybe had figured it out by blowing out BYU by 30 points the week prior. But 
it definitely seems like Houston has probably spent everything that they had to expend in the last two games to salvage this season. And Kansas State, you know, an interesting detail of the season, like, you know, fans are still kind of writhing your hands a little bit over how they lost to Oklahoma State and Missouri, two teams that look pretty good, by the way. And Kansas State had to play those two on the road. If you look at all these other five games, they beat UCF by about 20. They beat mm-hmm. Texas Tech by about 20. Uh, they beat SEMO by 45. They beat Troy by 30. And they just beat TCU by about 40. So their wins are not even close at this point. They're just – every time they win, they're just completely destroying it and their opponent. So best case, worst case. The best case scenario for Kansas State is a repeat Big 12 championship, I think, because you know Texas looked very mortal. You saw Quinn Ewers get hurt. Malik Murphy comes in. Texas looked like a team that if K-State is playing its best, K-State can win that game. Now, that is no guarantee that that's going to happen, but it certainly feels like as long as K-State handles its business against Houston, that Texas game is going to be huge. It's going to have quite the spotlight if K-State does handle their business against Houston because you're talking about also the – you know the. The storyline that'll never go away. It is the last year of Texas and Oklahoma in the Big 12. Kansas State still has to exercise those Texas demons. I don't believe they have defeated the Longhorns since 2016. So that's something in itself. They have to go to Austin. Both of their losses are on the road. But like you said, Quinn Ewers, um, you know, perhaps we don't know what his availability will be for that game. Kansas State's actually had the fortune of playing a lot of backup quarterbacks this year. Um, so maybe that continues as well. But, you know, with the Longhorns, you know, you always have to remember their, their backups are, are still pretty good. So um, th- at the end of the day, that's something to be concerned about if you're if you're Kansas State. But this will be one of your biggest games you've played in the last, you know, well, in the Chris Kleiman era. Um, and I believe yeah. that's the last team that he has not beat that's in the Big 12. Well, and the thing is, last year, as good as K-State was, Texas did just kind of out-talent them, which right. you, you – We've kind of been waiting for Texas to be able to do that to teams, and now it seems like they're capable of it. But in this case, Kansas State seems to have found something special offensively, and uh, you're right, Will Howard did look like he kind of figured some stuff out. But Avery Johnson, I, like, I go that touchdown pass down the left sideline, I think it was to Treshawn Ward, he dropped that thing in the bucket. I mean, anybody who thinks this guy is just a runner, there's more to it than that. Yeah, and that was actually to another true freshman that had a breakout game. That was to Jace Brown, who had four catches. Oh, was Jace Brown. Okay, that's what it was. Yeah, four catches, 88 yards to score, and they needed, you know, a, a vertical threat. So they're kind of, you know, uncovering some pieces there that's really unlocking their offense some more. They have a second tight end that's starting to come on. And, of course, everyone knows about Ben Sinnott. All of a sudden, you know, fans always overreact to, you know, a positive and a negative too much, and then they were ready to – burn the house down, so to speak, when they lost to Oklahoma State. But since then, they found a lot of different ways to attack you as an offense. And there's a reason why Colin Klein was very much, you know, pulled in the Notre Dame direction in the offseason and nearly Mm -hmm. took that job. He's thought to be one of the brilliant offensive minds. I thought, you know, when they defeated TCU 41-3, to a lot of that was him just completely out coaching, a coaching mismatch with the TCU defensive coordinator that people lauded last year in Joe Gillespie. So – yeah. Um, that was a nice game in between the game. Now, the, the ceiling potential is certainly higher with Avery Johnson, and you wonder if that can kind of maybe even the score a little bit with Texas from a talent standpoint. Um, you certainly would think so. But, you know, it almost seems before that game, like I don't know that this two-quarterback system is, at least in the form that they threw it out against the Frogs, I don't know how that's sustainable, especially in a tight game where I think you have to pick one guy and go with it. Yeah, you may have to go with the hot hand, but it's interesting because I think if, if we'd have talked about this a few weeks ago, that if we talked about the worst case scenario, the floor for Kansas State would have felt a lot lower. It feels fairly high right now. I, eight and four feels like the absolute floor on this season. And I would be shocked if they weren't nine and three or better. Yeah, eight and four seems like the absolute floor because you have three winnable home games against Houston, Baylor, and Iowa State. So um, go undefeated at home, and that gets you eight and four. I think we're still left with the road game at Texas, obviously, that we've already discussed, and that all-important, maybe Sunflower most intriguing, showdown. 
Sunflower Showdown in about two decades. I think that one will have eyeballs that hasn't had eyeballs in, in a long time. But I, in the back of my mind, though, no, I wonder what's going on with KU, too. And I know that this isn't part of that, but that whole Jason Bean, Jalen Daniels thing, a quarterback, mm -hmm. also seems pretty strange. But for them, maybe in a negative way. Well, maybe we'll just have a Sunflower Showdown where there's a new quarterback every single series for both teams. That would be tremendous. I, I don't think I've ever seen a game like that. No. And the funny thing is, is Kansas State's also almost doing the same kind of platoon at running back between DJ Giddens and Treshawn Ward. I mean, Treshawn Ward has had two games now over 100 yards, and DJ Giddens has won with almost 300. And then again last night uh, on Saturday, almost another 200. So they're, they're deadly in the backfield. And the next time that TCU defends – uh, the running back in the passing game will be the first time because that was the real problem. Yeah, it. I, I imagine that Texas will probably do that better. Houston defended very well toward the end of that game against Texas. So I, I don't think Kansas State's going to be able to get away with quite as much as they did. But they gave, they gave Doug Belk at Houston a lot to chew on with that film from TCU. So I can't wait to see what, what Colin Klein pulls out of the bag of tricks next. Derek, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. That's Derek Young from K State Online, and I I can't wait to watch these guys. They're they're a lot of fun, and I do enjoy Colin Klein having a little fun with everybody by just playing both quarterbacks on the first play. <laughs> that was that was brilliant. When we come back on Monday, it's going to be a different kind of Monday show. We're changing up the format for the week. We're changing up the schedule a little bit. We're going to move the pick show from Wednesday to Monday, and we are going to move Dear Andy, the mailbag show, from Monday to Wednesday. So basically, we have swapped those. So our special guest picker will be Clark Brooks, our advanced analytics guide on three. He is awesome. Ball of energy. Cannot wait to see what he thinks about these games. Some juicy, juicy opening lines. South Carolina, Texas A&M, a two-touchdown underdog. There's also a bunch of road favorites. Ohio State is a two-touchdown favorite at Wisconsin. Oregon is a five-and-a-half-point favorite at Utah. Tennessee is a three-and-a-half-point favorite at Kentucky. This is going to be a very, very interesting week. We'll be back on Monday. Me and Clark picking games against the spread. We'll talk to you then.